A shower of roses, miracles and favors attributed to the intercession of Saint Therese of the Child Jesus, taken from Sister Therese of Lisieux, the Little Flower of Jesus. Imprimatur Edmund Sermont, 1912, Neil Obstadt, Johannes in Strasimar, S.J. Introduction I will spend my heaven in doing good upon earth. In heaven, the good God will do all I desire because I have never done my own will on earth. After my death, I will let fall a shower of roses. These gracious words of her who is known, wherever the English tongue is spoken as the little flower of Jesus, have been well fulfilled during the time after her death. The graces already attributed to her intercession are innumerable. The Carmel of Lisieux receives, only fifteen years after her death, on an average sixty letters daily containing acknowledgments of favors granted, and the confidence in the power of Sister Therese is attested by two hundred other letters which accompany them. It is the wish of the Little Queen, as she is also named among us, that her favors should be noised abroad. This she has repeatedly and clearly made known to her servants. In her lifetime she wrote to one of her missionary friends, I shall desire the same thing in heaven as upon earth, to love Jesus and to win him love. I confess that if in heaven I could not labor for his glory, I should prefer exile to home. But the more her power with God is revealed to men, the more will they invoke her, and the better will she promote his glory by doing good upon earth. Imitation will follow upon invocation, and the perfume of the roses will draw hearts along her simple pathway to heavenly heights. For if Therese heals suffering and soothes sorrow, it is always with the aim of winning more love for her spouse. Before her saintly death, she promised that she would not content herself with intercession, but would come down to her friends. Moreover, she declared that to her the lodestone of heaven was love, to love, to be loved, and to return to earth to win love for our love. Since rejoining her spouse, she has told one client, I wish to be everywhere known. To another, she said recently, My power is great with God, ask me what you will. A conversion was sought and was obtained within two or three days. A similar communication was made to a third, and the grace asked was immediately granted. In 1911 she revealed to a Carmelite nun that no one ever invokes her without some answer being vouchsafed, and very soon afterwards a startling miracle proved to the nun how true was the statement. Not all her answers are, of course, either so prompt or so clear, but the writer of these lines has repeatedly received letters amongst the hundreds which reach him concerning the little flower, in which her clients tell how their every request is heard. Doubtless the Carmel, from its tens of thousands, might tell a similar story. One letter speaks of a million teeny miracles, another acknowledges twelve temporal and eight spiritual favors, a third returns thanks for the recovery of several friends, clerical, religious lay, who were seriously ill, and also for the averting of several most grave calamities. Another is grateful for many spiritual and temporal favors, amongst them two situations, three postulants, and extraordinary conversion. While Litany received a few days ago from distance Drangeling, acknowledges one conversion, two baptisms, a reconciliation, and an income for a destitute widow, this last a great miracle, as there seemed no hope for support. She is invoked and successfully by airmen, she is in high favor with those who have to face the trying ordeal of examinations, as the thanksgiving testifies. In one case, a problem which a candidate had prayed she might have was given her both in the oral and written examinations. But the pen must be handed on to the fortunate clients that they may tell their own tale. On account of its extreme importance, the Galapoli rose is placed first, not only because it has been well authenticated by the ecclesiastical authorities of that diocese and by Monsignor de Tell, but chiefly because of its message concerning the little way to God, which is the mission of Sister Therese to the world. With it are grouped a handful of roses of varying shade and perfume. 
These are followed by a choice bouquet from the millions of roses she has left fall on the sick. This again by one of conversions wrought through her intercession. The last bouquet is formed of those golden roses of sweetest perfume, her graces of a happy death. The town of Gallipoli lies far down the map of Italy, just inside the heel and across from the Antaranto. Nearly three years ago the inmates of its little Carmel were in debt and utter starvation, at times substituting for their dinner a visit to the chapel. Several months previously the life of Sister Therese had been publicly read in the community, and now the prioress decided to make a special appeal for three days to the Blessed Trinity through the intercession of the little flower of Jesus. The tritium ended on January 16, 1910. On that day, Sister Therese kept her promise of doing good upon earth and of coming down by bringing in person 500 francs to the distressed prioress. But this was only the beginning of a series of prodigies destined to throw into relief a seemingly chance remark of the little flower to Mother Mary Carmela on that occasion. My way is a sure one. The following letters from Gallipoli and elsewhere tell their own story. It must be premised that a most strict canonical investigation has been made of the facts here related, and that the distinguished Jesuit who presided over the first tribunal, after having emphatically attributed the whole affair to diabolical intervention, was converted, by the overwhelming evidence, into an ardent apostle of Sister Therese of the Child Jesus and of the Holy Face. Letter from Mary Mother Carmela Prioress of the Carmel of Gallipoli, to Mother Agnes of Jesus, Prioress of the Carmel of Lisieux. Dear Reverend Mother, I send you the account of the miracle wrought on our behalf, but a long document signed by the whole community, by a commission of priests, and by the bishop himself has been forwarded to Rome. On the night of the 16th of January, 1910, I was in great suffering, and was also worried about certain grave difficulties. Three o'clock had been struck, and almost worn out. I raised myself somewhat in bed in order to breathe more easily. Then I fell asleep, and in a dream, it would seem to me, I felt a hand touch me, draw the bedclothes about my face, and cover me up tenderly. I thought one of the sisters had come in to perform this act of charity, and, without opening my eyes, I said to her, Leave me for I am all in perspiration, and this movement gives me too much air. And then a sweet voice, which I had never heard before, replied, No, it is a good act that I am doing. Listen, the good God makes use of his inhabitants of heaven, as well as of those of earth, in order to assist his servants. Here are five hundred francs, with which you will pay the debt of your community. Taking them from her hand, I answered that the debt amounted to only three hundred francs, well, she replied, the rest will be over and above, but as you may not keep this money in your cell, come with me. The night was bitterly cold. How shall I rise, I thought, all bathed in perspiration as I am. The heavenly apparition, however, divined my thoughts, adding with a smile, by location will help us. Suddenly, I found myself outside my cell, in the company of a young Carmelite nun, whose veil and robes shone with a brightness of paradise that served to light up our way. She led me downstairs to the turn-room or parlor, and made me open a wooden box wherein was enclosed the bill which had to be paid. There she deposited the five hundred francs. I looked at her lovingly, and threw myself at her feet, crying out, O oh, my holy mother! But she raised me up, and caressing me affectionately, replied, No! I am not our Holy Mother. I am the servant of God, Sister Therese of Lisieux. Today in heaven and on earth we keep the feast of the holy name of Jesus. Quivering with emotion, not knowing what to say, I cried out again, and the words came from my heart more than from my lips. O oh, my mother! But I could say no more. Then the angelic sister, putting her hand on my veil as if to adjust it, gave me a sisterly embrace, and slowly withdrew. Wait, I called to her. You might mistake your way. No, no, she answered with a heavenly smile. My way is sure, and I am not mistaken in following it. 
I awoke, and in spite of my exhaustion, I rose, went to choir, and in due course received Holy Communion. The sisters noticed that something was wrong and wished to send for the doctor. In the sacristy, the two sacristans insisted strongly on knowing what was the matter with me. They also desired that I should go to bed and have the doctor summoned. To prevent this, I explained that I was deeply moved by the impression of a dream, and in all simplicity I told them my story. Both of them urged me to examine the box. Finally, as they insisted, I did as they desired. I went to the parlor, opened the box, and there I found in reality the miraculous sum of five hundred francs. The rest, dear mother, I leave to your own imagination. Overwhelmed by such goodness, we are one and all praying that our great protectress, little sister Therese, may be beatified. Letter from Mother Mary Carmela to Mother Agnes of Jesus Dear Reverend Mother, It cost me very much to confide to you what the dear little sister Therese has done for us since the month of February, but I can no longer resist your prayers, or my little saint who obliges me to make manifest the prodigies which God has wrought through her. At the end of the month of January, in spite of the care with which the sisters who have charge of the income and expenditure kept their books, we found a surplus of twenty-five lire. This we were unable to explain unless on the supposition that Sister Therese had slipped it into our cash box. The bishop, therefore, desired me to place apart from the money of the community the two blank notes that still remained of the ten which heaven had sent. At the end of February, March, and April, the same strange thing happened, but the amount varied. In the month of May I saw my little Therese again. She spoke to me at first upon spiritual matters, and then she added, To prove to you that it was indeed I who brought you the surplus of money that has been noticed in the settling of your accounts, you will find in the cash box a banknote of fifty francs. With God, to say is to do. And now, my good mother, must I confess it to my shame? This time again I did not dare to examine the box, but the good God, who wished me to verify this new marvel, permitted that on one of the following days two of the sisters should come and ask, out of devotion, to be allowed to see the two miraculous banknotes. Mother, what shall I say? You may understand our emotion. Instead of two notes, there were three. In the month of June, we found fifty lire in the usual way. During the night between the 15th and the 16th of July, I saw my beloved Therese once more. She promised to bring me, before long, one hundred lire. Then she wished me a happy feast and offered me a banknote of five lire. As I did not dare accept it, she placed it at the foot of the little statue of the Sacred Heart in our cell, and shortly after, when the bell had rung, I found the note where I had seen her put it. Some days later, the bishop, in the course of the conversation, told us he had lost a banknote of a hundred lire when making up his diocesan accounts, and he expressed the hope that Sister Therese would bring it to us. It came on the 6th of August, the eve of the Feast of St. Cachian, whose name the bishop bears. Again, I saw my dearly loved Therese. In her hand she held a banknote of a hundred lire, and she said, The power of God takes away or gives with the same ease in matters temporal, as in matters spiritual. Having found the note of a hundred lire in the box, I hastened to send it to the bishop with the good wishes of the community. He, however, returned it to us. Since then she has brought us no more money, for our distress has become known through these marvels, and alms have been sent to our Carmel. But on September 5th, the eve of the exhumation of her remains, I saw her again. After having spoken to me, as she always did, on the spiritual welfare of the community, she announced that they would find only her bones in the grave. Next, she made me understand something of the prodigies she will accomplish in the future. Count it for certain, my dear mother, that her blessed remains will work great miracles and will be as mighty weapons against the devil. Sister Therese appeared to me generally at dawn and when I was engaged in prayer. Her countenance was radiant and extremely beautiful. Her garments glittered with a light as of transparent silver. Her words had the sweetness of a heavenly melody. 
She revealed to me the great, though hidden crosses she bore so heroically upon earth. Little Therese has indeed suffered deeply. What more shall I say? It is enough, my dear mother, that you know we feel near us the spirit of your angelic child. All the sisters affirm, with tender affection, that, besides the temporal favors granted to the community, each one has been the recipient of very great and personal graces. The Sequel A year passed, and on the anniversary of the first apparition at Gallipoli, the little flower herself gave an explanation of her conduct. The reader will remember her words to her novices during her lifetime. Have faith in all I have told you and the confidence we should have in God. Have faith in the way I have taught you of going to Him through self-abandonment and love. I shall come back and shall tell you whether I am mistaken or if my way is sure. Until then, follow it faithfully. Monsignor Gian Atticio, Bishop of Nardo, near Gallipoli, was not aware she had spoken thus. Yet he had always regretted that more stress had not been laid upon the spiritual meaning of her words to Mother M. Carmela, My way is a sure one. To his mind these clearly referred to the path of self-surrender and of trust in God so warmly recommended by the saint. Haunted by this idea, Monsignor Giannatesio determined to celebrate the anniversary of their utterance by presenting the Carmel with a banknote of five hundred lire which someone had given him. He enclosed the note accordingly in an open envelope, together with his visiting card, having first written on the latter, In memoriam, my way is a sure one, I am not mistaken. Sister Therese of the Child Jesus to Sister Mary Carmela, Gallipoli, January 16, 1910. Pray for me daily that God may have mercy on me. This envelope the bishop inserted in a large one of stouter paper which he carefully sealed, and on which he wrote to be placed in the cash box and to be opened by Mother Prioress on January 16, 1911. It was a simple act of devotion by which he intended to obtain the blessing of the servant of God on himself and his diocese. No miracle was asked. His lordship knew that several of the community were anxious to have their poverty-stricken chapel decorated. Three hundred lire was needed for this, and Mother Carmela had opposed the project, but she had finally consented to give a novena to the little flower. His lordship intended to give them a pleasant surprise. He forwarded his envelope about the end of December, and on January 16 he himself arrived at the Carmel for the purpose of giving a retreat. He was informed that his letter was still in the cash box. Mother Carmela now took it out, and she was told to open it, and the bishop watching her narrowly as she did so. She passed her finger under the upper flap, thus leaving the seal intact, and then handed him the envelope with the remark, My lord, take what belongs to you. His lordship found, to his amazement, that in addition to the smaller envelope he had placed inside, there were four banknotes, two of one hundred lire and two of fifty lire. His own note of five hundred lire lay still untouched in the inner envelope. The money is yours, my lord, said the mother prioress, but please count it. If there are three hundred lire, might it not be the sum which the community has been so confidently asking from Sister Therese? If you wish, I shall call the sisters that you may give it to them yourself. This was done, but not before his lordship had exchanged one of the new notes, which emitted a perfume of roses, for another of the same value. He also scrutinized closely the seal. It was unbroken. Mother Carmel confessed to noticing some days previously that the envelope had increased in bulk, and told the bishop of her presentiment that their heavenly benefactress had heard the sisters' prayers. He replied, however, that he saw a higher purpose in the miracle, the confirmation, namely, of the saint's remark, My way is a sure one. And he showed the astonished Pyrrhus the contents of the inner envelope, the note of five hundred francs, and his visiting card with its inscription. Some time after, Monsignor Muller of Gallipoli held a strict canonical investigation into the whole matter, the result of which was to be placed beyond question the intervention of the little flower of Jesus. 
The above account is drawn from the Articles for the Cause of Beatification, 2nd edition, July 1911. It may fittingly be supplemented by the following narratives. A Challenge Accepted A Convent in Scotland, 1912 At recreation one day, some of the sisters were discussing certain small favors received which they attributed to the intercession of the Little Flower of Jesus. One or two were rather enthusiastic as to her influence with the Sacred Heart. The others listened passively, but as the same subject of discourse was kept up for a few recreations, they seemed bored at the praises given to Therese. The superioress sided with the majority, and, to stop the discussion, said, Well, do you, who have such confidence, ask her to send us a large ciborium? The two small ones we have are quite insufficient for a large number of daily communicants. Then we shall see whether she is a saint or not. So it was agreed that the clients of the little flower, sisters, and children should make a novena of communions for that intention. The novena finished, but no ciborium appeared, and great was the triumph of the opposition party. Some did not hesitate to say, You see, she is not a saint. Good enough, of course, but somewhat too self-conscious. After all, what extraordinary things did she do for God? Her supporters still maintained that she was a saint, and felt convinced Therese would send a large ciborium for the children, as they were now all daily communicants. They immediately began another novena with increased earnestness, asking her to obtain from the Sacred Heart a speedy answer. During the second novena, our collecting sisters were staying for a few days at the house of a pious gentleman who usually gave them hospitality. One evening, while conversing in presence of their host, the Holy Father's decree on daily communion was discussed. The sisters spoke of the large number of our children who were daily communicants. Though they had no idea we were making a novena for our ciborium, they mentioned that our ciboriums were small. They spoke also of our anxiety when watching our poor old priest trying to ascend the altar steps. This he had to do more frequently now, on account of the increased numbers for Holy Communion. Strange to say, their story received but scant sympathy, and the matter seemingly dropped. But next morning, when the sisters came downstairs, our gracious benefactor was standing at the foot with a ciborium in his hand. Oh, what a beauty, they exclaimed. That's for you, he replied. You may write and tell your superior about it, but ask her to kindly return me the small one which I gave her. Their surprise and pleasure may be imagined, and great was the children's delight on hearing the news. They continued their prayers and made a novena of thanksgiving. But as our benefactor had procured a different ciborium to that shown to the sisters, some little delay was caused. However, their desire of seeing Therese's gift was fulfilled on the 1st of December, when the superioress brought into the classroom a handsome silver gilt ciborium. They clapped their hands, and then knelt down to thank the Sacred Heart and his little white flower for having heard their prayers. The opposition party still refused to own themselves beaten. You don't call this an answer to prayer, they said. If the little flower cannot give without making an exchange, she is not much of a saint. The objection was presently overcome in quite a startling way. After a letter of thanks to the pious donor, there came an immediate reply to the effect that he had ordered a second large ciborium. This arrived on December 11th and proved to be of silver, beautifully chased. Our other small ciborium had to be returned to the mother house, and today we have two large and lovely ones, thanks to Sister Therese. Needless to say, all our sisters are now only too willing to acknowledge the great influence she must possess with the Sacred Heart. She has the unbounded love of the children, and as a token of gratitude, they daily say aloud the prayer for her beatification. The Little Flower and the Altar A Convent of Mercy, Scotland, 1912 The opening of a branch house usually brings many wants, and among the articles required for our chapel were altar candlesticks. I petitioned the little flower to provide them for us, and after a few days I said to the sisters that it showed a want of confidence not to order them. I did so, and on that very day I received a banknote from a former pupil in America. 
the exact sum required. Larger candlesticks have since been given, the gift of another unlooked-for donor. I was told that until we obtained a monstrance, benediction could not be given. Placing this difficulty in the hands of Sister Therese, I begged her to use her influence on our behalf. In a few days, the question came from an unexpected quarter. What was most required? I mentioned the monstrance. It was ordered forthwith, and it is a beautiful one of solid silver gilt, thanks to dear Sister Therese. I can say with truth that not a week does not pass without some favor being granted through her intercession, and as a rule I receive more than I dare ask. I am only too pleased to do her honor, and I sincerely hope the day is not far distant where we shall hear of her beatification. The Little Flower and the Weather The Carmel of Bourges les Santes, Belgium, June seventeenth, 1912 Our community possesses the treasure of holy poverty, and we are obliged, in order to live, to help ourselves by the work of our hands. A considerable portion of our enclosure consists of meadowland. Every year we make hay on it, which is sold for the benefit of the community, while the hay was being cut this year, the weather was bad, and it remained in torrents. It was still raining when the time came for us to stack it, and one of our youngest sisters said to me, Mother, will you give me leave to put a picture of Sister Therese in the field, and beg her to give us some sun at once? Very well, I replied, and I promised the dear little sister that at the first ray of sunshine we will begin the novena for her beatification and we will also announce the favor to our nuns at Lisieux. The picture was carried to the meadow before Mass. During the holy sacrifice, the clouds dispersed, and cheering rays of sun began to appear. But the wind still remained in the west. Then the sister, who had put the picture in the field, said to our little saint, If it is you who are giving us this fine weather, make the wind change. Immediately the weathercock turned to the north, and for five days we had magnificent weather in which to finish our hard work. When all the hay was stacked, we took away the picture, and the rain began once more. An Escape from Death, United States On September 2, 1908, I was in New York with our Reverend Mother, and when returning to the station, we had to cross a very crowded thoroughfare. Imagining somehow that our mother had already crossed, I followed, but it turned out that, seeing an electric car approach, she had held back. It was too late to warn me. I received the full blow and was, of course, thrown down. As soon as the conductor could stop the car, a crowd collected, expecting to see me crushed, but I regained my feet absolutely unhurt without even a scratch or bruise, as testified afterwards by the convent doctor. My spectacles were not even broken, nor did I feel in any way dazed. The crowd grew larger every minute, and newspaper reporters pressed round to ask my name. To this our mother answered, She is an exile nun from France. God hath wrought a miracle in her favor. They looked bewildered, and could not scarcely believe that I was not injured. The conductor said that the measure of my body might have been taken, so accurately had I fallen between the wheels. These street cars are much larger and heavier than ours, and have underneath an apparatus of chains which, in the ordinary course, would be bound at least to cause injury. I had been saved by Sister Therese. I felt it at the time of the accident. In my pocket I carried one of her little photographs from which I have never since parted. For a few moments after the accident, it seemed to me as though I were in another world, so strong was the sense of the supernatural. An Accident Averted Darkly, near Dublin, Ireland, December 31, 1911 An old man aged seventy-two has for a long while had a special devotion to the little flower. He can neither read nor write, but his wife read him the life of Sister Therese, and he has always a picture of her with him. One morning, at the time when he ought to have set out for work, his wife noticed that he was not getting ready, and seeing him look somewhat strange, she asked him what had happened. I saw the little flower, he replied. I don't know if I were awake or asleep, but I saw her distinctly, and she said to me, 
Do not go to work in that quarry. His wife would not believe him, but with tears in his eyes he repeated, I saw her. She was beautiful and looked just like her picture. He did not go to work. It happened that on that same day another man working in the same quarry met with a serious accident of which our friend might have been a victim had not he been warned by Sister Therese. The stone fell on the spot where he usually worked. The good old man has again seen his heavenly benefactress. At this time she was accompanied by a lay sister of a certain convent for the repose of whose soul he had prayed fervently. He understood that she meant him to know that his prayers were granted and that this soul was in heaven. The Little Flower and the Pony We have a little new forest pony, and during June 1911, he had a violent attack of double pneumonia. The groom and the veterinarian surgeon stayed up with him one whole night. In the morning he was no better. About midday, the groom came and called me to go and see the poor little animal. He was trembling and quivering all over, and groaning with pain as he struggled for his breath. His poor little head was hanging quite down between his four feet. When I called him, he could not lift his head, but he turned a little and gazed up at me out of his piteous and terror-stricken eyes. I have never seen anything quite so hopeless. The groom told me that if his legs gave way and he lay down, he would surely die. He had neither eaten or drunk for about twenty-four hours. I sent the groom to bring back the veterinarian surgeon and asked the latter to fetch some broad, strong straps that we might put them under the pony and so help to support him. I could have cried. But I went out of the stable to where Eleanor and Elizabeth were standing in silence and grief and said to them, The pony is dying, I fear. Pray quickly to the little flower. I recited some Hail Marys and went in again to the little creature. Never mind, dear old boy, I said. You are not dead yet. I had literally to lift his head up and support his neck on my shoulder. I shall never forget the look of love that he gave me. I kept saying Hail Marys to the little flower, and I made the sign of the cross three times in the name of the Blessed Trinity on his face. He lifted up his neck from my shoulder, and walked two or three steps and held up his head completely changed. I called Eleanor to run and get a bit of sugar to see if I could tempt him to eat it. There was a pail of water for him in the corner and some ground barley in his box. Before Eleanor got back with the sugar, he had walked over to his pail and taken a long drink, and then walked back to his box and began to eat his food. This is the exact truth. He was eating and drinking in less than five minutes from the moment that I entered the stable, and in less than one since I prayed to the little flower. When the veterinarian surgeon and the groom returned with the big leathern belts, they could not believe the evidence of their own eyes. While coming back, they had been discussing what my judgment would be as to putting the poor little creature out of his misery. So hopeless was the case, and so sure were they he was going to die. He is alive today, merry and beloved, but he cannot do any carriage work. He can only run about the lanes with the children riding on him. A fire extinguished. Hotel de l'Amatage, Les Vorons, France, August 1st, 1911. This morning about one o'clock a fire broke out in the small chalet belonging to the hotel where I usually pass the summer, and, as it was composed entirely of wood, the whole building was in flames in an instant. The larger hotel, two or three yards away, is surrounded by a wooden balcony. It also caught fire. The roof began to burn, and we had only a few jugs of water with which to extinguish the flames. To make matters worse, a fir tree close by became enkindled, thus endangering the whole forest, and the exceptional dryness of the place accentuated the peril. At this moment I threw into the flames a picture of Sister Therese, with a little piece of her clothing attached to it. Instantly, the fir tree stopped burning of itself, and the sparks which were literally raining down on the hotel ceased falling and were raised into the shape of a dome over the roof. 
and thus the terrible danger was averted. In the opinion of the residents at the hotel, about forty in all, it was a real miracle, and many, who did not even know that we had invoked Sister Therese, testified afterwards to the watchful care of divine providence. As for me, from the moment I threw the picture into the flames, I had not the least doubt but that that little saint of Lisieux would assist us with her powerful intercession. A Gift of Money Editor's Remarks Countless stories are told of the little flower's influence in matters financial. The Chancellor of a diocese in Great Britain has acknowledged a favor of this kind in the Catholic press. A bishop has testified to such favors before the tribunal for the beatification. The following gracious First Communion story is confirmed by the husband of the narrator, and the reliability of both has been emphatically attested by their parish priest in Dublin. Last November I was in great difficulties. My little boy was to make his first communion, and I had no money to buy him new clothes. We had only a half-crown in the house, and this was wanted for necessities. Shortly before, I had heard of the little flower of Jesus and of her numerous miracles. I was especially interested in the miracle of the money found in the cash-box at Galapoli, and I wished the little flower would renew it in my favor. The thought pursued me, and I told my husband of it. A sovereign would be enough, I said to myself. For some days I had a strong feeling that the little flower was not far away. At times I almost expected to see her, especially towards nightfall. On the evening of November 22nd, the first day of the retreat, at the end of which my boy was to make his first communion, I went to our writing desk to get the half-crown. The drawer was locked, and I had the key in my pocket. I unlocked it, and instead of picking up the coin at once, something induced me to feel by the side of it. My finger touched another coin, and I took out a sovereign. So great was my amazement that I could not believe what I saw. I took the coin to my husband and my father, who had just come in, to ask them if my eyes deceived me. The occurrence, from a natural point of view, admits of no explanation. It might be urged that my husband or I had put the coin aside and then forgotten it. This is quite impossible. Our poverty would not allow us to lay by such a sum without remembering it, or to lose it without noticing. A Cure of Cancer On August 27, 1909, Mrs. Dorans of the Parish of Our Lady and St. Margaret's, Glasgow, was suddenly and completely cured of a cancerous tumor. The disease had so far progressed that her doctor, a Protestant, had said on the eve of her cure that she would in all probability die on the following day. In the morning he found the cancer gone. If this is going to be permanent, he remarked when he had recovered from his stupefaction, it is nothing short of a miracle. It is a good thing, he added, for professional men like us to know that these things are in a higher hand. After all, I believe that there is a God. A number of years ago, Mrs. Dorans, the widowed mother of a large family, began to suffer from continual pain in the left side of the abdomen. She persevered, in spite of it, to attend her household duties. The suffering was the effect of a tumor which gradually increased in size until, for three years before its disappearance, she scarcely had a moment's respite. Her nights were practically sleepless, as she could not rest for more than seven or eight minutes at a time. By the month of April 1909, the gravity of her state was such that her doctor, Dr. Carmichael, advised her to enter one of the Glasgow infirmaries in order to undergo an operation. Examination of the tumor by Professor Jamal and others made it clear that any attempt at an operation would be certainly fatal, a conclusion which the professor insisted upon with considerable emphasis. Consequently, about the middle of May, after a couple weeks in the infirmary, she returned home to die. Gradually the poor sufferer grew weaker. There were also dangerous internal complications, and the pain became very acute. For ten weeks the stomach was unable to retain anything in the form of food. 
Even the taking of ice or of soda water resulted in severe vomiting attacks. All this time her friends had been storming heaven for her recovery, and novena after novena had been made, particularly to the Sacred Heart and to Our Lady of Lourdes. The invalid nevertheless sank rapidly. Finally, on August 22nd, a Sister of Mercy, aware of the dying woman's intense faith, proposed a novena to the little flower of Jesus, a saint not yet canonized. Mrs. Dorans consented on condition that the Sacred Heart and Our Lady were included, so it was arranged between them that the Holy Carmelite should ask the Blessed Virgin to take her to the Sacred Heart, and that she, the little flower, should ask for the cure from our loving Lord. A beginning was made that day, Sunday. For four days she continued to sink, and on the evening Thursday the watchers hardly expected her to live till morning. She could now see things only very indistinctly, and her agony was intense. Her confessor proposed again to administer the last sacraments, but, confident that she would survive a few hours longer, she begged to have them on the morrow as an immediate preparation for going before God, and they were in consequence delayed. About 11 p.m., the poor creature, having taken a small piece of ice, had another dreadful attack of vomiting, which quite exhausted her. After this, she fell asleep. Her daughter, watching by her side, worn out with nursing, soon followed her example. The invalid slept on quietly. It was her first real repose for several years. About half past five on Friday morning, Mrs. Dorans was aroused by a gentle pressure on her each shoulder as if someone was leaning over her. At the same time she felt a sweet, warm breath upon her face and knew that an invisible presence was beside her. Opening her eyes, she found that she could distinguish clearly the objects in the room. All pain had left her, and she enjoyed a sense of well-being that was an indescribable relief after the years of torture. She made a most fervent act of thanksgiving to the Sacred Heart, whose picture hung opposite the bed. Then scarcely, realizing the favor vouchsafed her, she fell asleep once more, this time for the space of twenty minutes. On awakening she ventured to feel the tumor, only to discover with delight that it had disappeared, together with the huge swelling which accompanied it. Mrs. Dorans next awoke her daughter. She assured her that she felt refreshed, and, after drinking a tumbler of soda water, slept again for a half an hour. After this she felt so well and hungry that she begged for a roll and a cup of tea. As she had not yet acquainted her family with what had happened, and they thought the request of a dying person's whim. To their amazement, their mother thoroughly enjoyed the cup of tea, the first for three months. A little later, she asked that Dr. Carmichael might be sent for immediately. The family now feared the worse, and the doctor came in haste, expecting to find his patient in her death agony or already dead. His astonishment was great on finding the invalid bright and full of life. Asking what had happened, he was told smilingly that was for him to find out. After a prolonged examination, he called the eldest daughter into the room, and in presence of both declared that, assuredly, the patient was better, and every organ of the body was now working properly. The swelling had gone, and the only trace of the tumor was a teeny lump less than the size of a marble. It may be added that this lump had disappeared by the next day. The cancer itself was a hard tumor situated in the left lumbar region and was the size of an orange on its anterior surface, but it did not project above the skin. It was almost immobile and seemed to adhere to the structure below the skin. No serpation had taken place nor was there any evidence of the liver having been affected. The patient was very much emaciated. The effect upon Dr. Carmichael was one of bewilderment, and he begged for an explanation. Mr. Dorans told him of the prayers that had been offered up to the little wonder-worker of the Sioux. He then asserted that if any other physician was brought in and told in what state the patient had been a few hours before, he would refuse point-blank to credit it. 
Mrs. Doran's had been beyond the power of medical skill, and a higher hand had been there. Later on, he gave a certificate which witnessed to the diagnosis of the cancer, the state of extreme weakness of his patient, his intense surprise at the change which took place on August 27, 1909, the absence of all the old symptoms on the occasion of an examination made July 10, 1910, about the same time an X-ray photograph by Dr. Riddell did not reveal anything abnormal. The patient gradually recovered her full strength and was able once again to return to her heavy household work, and even to devote herself occasionally to the night and day nursing of sick friends. The Cure of a Fractured Skull, March 1909 Sister Therese seemed to show a special favor to my family. Two years ago she cured me of a tubulicular disease, and now my brother, eleven years of age, has just been suddenly saved by her. Here are the facts of the case. On Saturday, August twenty second, 1908, he met with a dreadful accident. Falling a height of about twenty feet through a trap door into a cellar, he struck his head on a terrible blow. The poor boy was picked up unconscious, and blood was streaming from the wound. The doctor declared it was a matter of two hours. The skull had been fractured in several places, and death was imminent. Nevertheless, the night passed, and he was still living. The doctor called in a surgeon, who, without hesitation, confirmed the opinion of his confrere. Humanly speaking, there was no chance of life. I had myself heard the doctor's verdict, and in the face of such an opinion it would have been folly to dare hope. But I was guilty of this folly, likewise my parents, and on August 24, at my request, Reverend Mother, you began a novena to Sister Therese. Meanwhile, violent and repeated attacks caused us much alarm. On four occasions we thought death was at hand and for eight days the poor child was unconscious and in wild delirium. On the ninth day, he recognized everyone around him and became quite calm. The cure was complete. It was only remained for him to regain strength, which he did within a very short time. He is now at school without any trace, either physical or mental, of his accident. Trampled Upon by a Horse, New York, August 12, 1909 for the glory of God and of his servant, Therese, the little flower of Jesus, I wish to make known a great favor received through the intercession of this holy Carmelite. The grace obtained is the extraordinary cure of my sister, who had been fatally injured. She was walking in the street of New York on the morning of July 30, 1909, when she was knocked down by a restive horse and trampled upon. Her face was horribly bruised and her head so injured that she was covered with blood. Worse still, her ribs were broken and driven into the lungs. The heart was also injured. In a word, she was a most pitiable object. She did not, however, lose consciousness even in her intense agony, and was able to make her confession in the street to a priest who had hastened from the nearest church. The doctor of the New York ambulance did not think that she could possibly reach the hospital alive, and all the hope he could hold out was that only one in a thousand would recover after such terrible injuries. The poor girl hung the whole day between life and death, and towards midnight all hope was given up. Every breath seemed to be her last. She remained in this agony till August 3rd, and then it was that a nun, who was very devout to Sister Therese, advised us to put our whole confidence in her and begin a novena. I gave my sister a relic of the little saint, which she applied to her mangled body with the greatest confidence. At once she began to mend, and on the last day of the novena she was saved. Her lung grew perfectly strong again, and her health has become good as before the accident. Apparition to a First Communicant on January 2, 1910, one of our pupils, aged 11, and of frail appearance, became feverish. A fortnight later, the little girl found on getting up that her legs were painful and that she could scarcely walk. 
The doctors, attributed this pain to weakness, prescribed a tonic in order that her leg should be massaged, but the little patient would scream when they were touched. Another doctor was consulted, and he insisted on making the child walk. She could take not one step without help, and it caused her intense suffering, while all massaging became unbearable. The parents, finding these remedies of no avail, and much distress at their child's sufferings, consulted a third doctor, who treated her for hip joint disease. At the end of a month, far from having yielded to the new treatment, she had grown worse. Not only did her legs, now quite useless, cause her pain, but her back did so too. The bones became disjointed and a hump began to form. A specialist was next consulted, and he gave us his opinion that the patient was suffering from paralysis of the spinal cord. He proposed having recourse to electricity and said that at the end of a year she might walk, possibly. Our little pupil was very downcast. The first communion day was drawing near, and she felt she would be unable to approach the altar with her companions. Finding all human means unavailing, it occurred to me to tell her of Sister Therese of the Child Jesus, whose life I was then reading, and I advised her to ask for her intercession. At this she became quite bright. The little flower of Jesus will cure me, she explained. I shall walk for my first communion. From that day she invoked her constantly. Little flower, cure me. Little flower, pray for me. Morning and evening the parents joined their prayers to hers, and the school children likewise prayed most earnestly. But the little flower seemed deaf to our entreaties. Three weeks before the first communion day the sufferer was worse than ever, and all hope of curing was abandoned. According to the doctor's advice, she had undergone electric treatment twice, but all to no purpose, and besides, he had not said she may be able to walk in a year's time. During the night between Wednesday and Thursday and Easter week, the little invalid was lying as usual in her bed, with a light burning in the room because of her sleepiness and great timidity. Suddenly, on opening her eyes, she saw, to use her own words, a pretty little face smiling at her. She was rather frightened and made the sign of the cross. The apparition smiled still more and seemed to come closer. You will soon be able to walk, it said, this very day even. It remained a few minutes longer, smiling all the while on the little friend, now quite reassured. Then it vanished. In the morning the happy Marie said to her parents, I am going to walk today. I have seen the little flower during the night, and she told me so. Marie had never seen a photograph of Sister Therese, but her heart told her that this angelic vision could be none other than the little saint she had so confidently invoked. Towards three o'clock in the afternoon, she was reclining on a couch to which she had been carried when she heard again the sweet, gentle voice of the vision. Walk was the word that sounded in her ear. Instantly, raising to her feet, the sick child ran to throw herself into the arms of her mother, who could scarcely credit her eyes, since for three months Marie had not walked one step. Three weeks later, the young client of the Flower of Jesus made her first communion and was confirmed together with her delighted companions. When she came to see me, I placed in her hands the autobiography of Sister Therese, on seeing the first picture, she exclaimed, This is indeed the face that I saw. I recognize it. And then she added, She was dressed as a nun, but I did not notice her veil. It is her face alone that is stamped on my memory. And her own features seem also to bear the imprint. She has become more thoughtful and serious, and in fact, I may say that the little saint has restored her to us quite converted as well as strong of limb. Sight Restored to an Aged Priest St. Jean de Luz, France, July 23, 1910 In the spring of 1900, I was then 67, I consulted Dr. N. relative to my anemic condition. Before I left him, he drew my attention to the fact that I was suffering from cataract. I did not quite believe this statement, 
So when I was in Paris the following September, I called to see Dr. Abadi, a famous oculist. One of his assistants examined my eyes most carefully and confirmed the opinion of Dr. N., but he told me the cataract could not be operated upon for perhaps ten years. Since then, I have consulted neither oculist nor doctor relative to my eyes, nor have I used any remedy. What Dr. Abadi, assistant, to- foretold gradually came true. My sight grew weaker, and even with the help of strong glasses, I had great difficulty in reading and writing. From the beginning of 1908, I could not recognize anyone two yards off, and after dusk, I dared not venture out. In May of 1909, an optician, who tested my sight in various ways, declared the right eye completely lost and the left one in a very bad state. This, however, was a slight exaggeration, because I could still distinguish with my right eye a form at a distance of a couple of feet, but so vaguely that I could not say if it were that of a human being. On Palm Sunday, 1909, I fell down the altar steps, and it now became clear to me that within a short while both mass and breviary would be impossible. I was dreading the prospects of the journey to Paris and the operation, when divine providence intervened and put me in touch with the colleague of an oculist who needs neither ointment nor surgeon's knife. Last spring, the Reverend Mother of the Carmelites of Bordeaux, in exile at Zarus, Spain, sought to make use of my skill in beekeeping. I explained to her that the condition of my eyes prevented me from doing as she asked, and in reply she said she would storm heaven to obtain the restoration of my sight. A few days later I was astounded to find I could read with comparative ease, and was now able to distinguish the altar steps. I went, therefore, to Zarus, and there I learned the community had made a novena for me through the intercession of Sister Therese of Lisieux, of whom I had never even heard. To have obtained this improvement for me, a stranger, and without asking, was indeed a gracious act on the part of the dear saint. I say improvement, because my sight was not yet fully restored. We agreed to make a second novena, during the course of which I was to apply my eyes daily a relic of my heavenly oculist. Before the end of the novena I could read the smallest print, and I could recognize people at a distance of a hundred paces. This novena was begun on May 19th, and in June I returned to Spain to reorganize the hives of the Carmelite convent. It was then we made a third novena, this time in thanksgiving, and to obtain a more perfect clearness of vision. Once more, my oculus granted our prayers. As I had recovered my sight, I resolved to take up beekeeping again and bought a colony of bees. A couple of days later I went to see my hive and found a few cells of queen bees, in some of which the eggs had already hatched. The sight of those infinitesimal eggs, just like fine threads of a bluish whiteness, rejoiced my heart. For years I have been unable to discern them even with powerful spectacles, and now I could see them again with the naked eye. With the utmost gratitude I'd raised my eyes to heaven, whence my celestial oculus had fulfilled for me her promise to do good on earth. There is therefore no room for doubt, the cure of my sight is both real and permanent, and clearly I am indebted for this wonderful favor, obtained without human help or remedy, to the intercession of whom we had invoked, Sister Therese of the Child Jesus of the Carmelite Convent of Lisieux, Rev. Chas Weber. Sight Restored to a Young Postulant Narrative of Margaret Malone, Motherwell, Scotland On September 24, 1910, I became a postulant in the convent of the Little Sisters of the Poor, Glasgow. One day I went to shut a window, and in doing so I lost my balance and fell. The sight of my left eye, which for some time had been dim, now disappeared entirely, and after a fortnight had elapsed, the pain in my head became so severe that I was forced to complain. On January 5th I saw the community doctor, and he told me it was a case of cataract, and that I should have to undergo an operation. I was sent to bed for a week, and then resumed my duties, but my left eye remained sightless. 
Meanwhile, all the sisters joined in a novena to the little flower. At first, she did not seem to heed us. Then I asked that she might keep her promise to spend her heaven in doing good upon earth. I never lost confidence. On February 4th, I was sent home in order that I might go to the eye infirmary. Two days later, I attended the West Regent Ophthalmic Institution. There I was told that the sight had completely gone and nothing could be done for me, and I was advised to take care of my right eye or I should lose it too. After this, I went to our family doctor in Motherwell, but I did not tell him that I had been to the institution. He confirmed the opinion of the professors, but he sent me to Glasgow Eye Infirmary, and here again I was declared incurable, not even worth an operation. I was given a note for a pair of spectacles, which, however, were to have only a plain glass for the left eye. I now prayed with renewed fervor to the little flower, for I knew the saints of God could do more than any professors or doctors. I made a novena of communions in her honor, and I offered her all my little sacrifices in order that she might cure me. The novena ended on Friday, and I was still blind, yet I never abandoned hope in Sister Therese. On Saturday morning I received Holy Communion and prayed with great fervor. Suddenly, when leaving the church, I found I could see with my left eye. I could hardly believe I was cured. That was on February 25, 1911, a fortnight after I had been given up by all the professors and doctors. I shut the good eye continually to find out if my cure was a true one. When I returned from church and told my people I was cured, they would not believe it. My mother put a bandage on the right eye in order to test the left one, and in this way I went about the house working for two days. Everyone wanted to test my sight, and when I would tell them what the various objects were that they held before me, they, like myself, had difficulty in believing that I really saw. I called on Dr. Jones of Motherwell, who was much surprised and wanted to know what had been done for me. He declared he had never seen a cure like it, and that a miracle had been wrought. As for myself, I claim to have recovered my sight through the intercession of the little flower of Jesus. The Conversion of a Protestant Minister Dear Reverend Mother, It is now some eighteen months since I first made the acquaintance of an English translation of the autobiography of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. I opened the book here and there, and was at once arrested with the beauty and the originality of the thoughts. I found there had fallen into my hands the work of a genius as well as of a theologian and poet of the first order. Returning to the first page, I read the whole book from cover to cover. The impression proved as lasting as it was extraordinary. Although at this time and for months afterwards I was diligently exploring the fogland of rationalism, my mind being steeped in its literature. This sweet and beautiful soul refused to quit me. She would hang lovingly about my path, trying to divert me from its fatal course. She would raise the alarm, saying, This is the way to the abyss. This is the way that leads to death. How often during those dark and lonely and hopeless days in which the supernatural was fast fading from my mind would she plant herself in my path and remonstrate, while repeatedly thoughts of her own lovely character would flash upon me, and words ringing through my soul, Can rationalism be true, and a life of such beauty and sweetness a lie? My inmost soul recoiled with a negative. I felt that if human life had any meaning and purpose, the life of this saintly Carmelite must have its meaning and goal. This was, I believe, the turning point in what I slowly realized to be a most dangerous journey. After traveling for months through the quagmire of skepticism, I began at the appealing voice of the saint of Lisieux to withdraw from its unhealthy atmosphere. I gradually lost confidence in its reckless conclusions. Its doctrines became more and more distasteful to me, especially after reading the complete French life of the little flower. It was while working my way back to something like solid grounds that a new edition of Le Histoire de Une Armée had been issued. I at once procured a copy, and, 
as afterwards learned, this turned out to be on the very day a novena to Sister Therese had been finished by some friends on my behalf. I read the book and found myself as deeply fascinated as when I first perused it. Never since my boyhood, when I converse one night with God, did I experience the powers of the world to come, as I did when going through the wonderful autobiography. On one occasion, I well remember, while thus occupied, the veil of the unseen seemed as if suddenly drawn aside, and I experienced an indescribable sense as of someone very close to me. No language can express the consciousness of the moment. It was so vivid, so delightful, and withal so unexpected and mysterious. But I could do as little doubt that this was the angelic saint of Lisieux as I could doubt the fact of my existence. I almost worshipped her. She seemed to me so amiable, so beautiful. Then I would thrust away from me every thought of her, accusing myself of superstition and idolatry. It was in vain she would return, absolutely refusing to quit me, and saying, Choose my little way, for it is sure. Well, little flower, I replied, I will try to follow your counsel, if you help me, for never, since the day I knew you, has my soul ceased to sigh after your way, so beautiful and so divine. This brief sketch, but very imperfectly, expresses the impressions which your angel produced on my heart. It is sufficient, however, I hope, to explain why it was that from this time the communion of saints as a grand and inspiring reality became with me a settled conviction. From this state, I began to ask her intercession on my behalf, though, at first, being a Protestant minister, I had to battle with my prejudices. One day, at my morning devotions, when about to invoke her, she said to me abruptly, Why do you ask me to pray for you, while you ignore the Blessed Virgin? The words surprised me, as I was not at the moment thinking about the Blessed Virgin, but I saw the inconsistency at once, and invoked her also. The promptitude of the response astonished me. Instantly my soul was flooded with a love for the Mother of God, as unexpected as it was extraordinary. My prejudices vanished, and I no longer doubted if it was right to treat Our Lady as a child caresses his mother. Not yet, however, did I contemplate entering the Catholic Church. At this date, I think sometime in February the present year, such a step was far from my intention, for many reasons, and among them this, that I was yet crassly ignorant of the teachings of the Catholic Church. Moreover, there was every prospect that but for the little flower of Jesus, I should remain in this ill-formed state of mind, for though I sometimes dipped into Catholic books, it was not with the object of discovering the exact nature of its teaching, but only to find matter for arguments against it. The influence of Sister Therese, however, awakened in me a genuine interest in the whole question of Catholicism, setting me to the study of it with an open mind and with no little seriousness. The result was that at the last light of conviction dawned, and as I was constrained in the teeth of lifelong prejudices and many dislikes to bow to an authority which I felt to be divine. It would be beside the purpose to recount the arguments through which this conviction came. It must suffice now to say that, after a short period of instruction, I was at length received into the church on April 20th, taking from my baptismal name that of my celestial guide and Savior unto Christ, Francis Maria Teresa. Meanwhile, how can I ever sufficiently prove my gratitude? To her I undoubtedly owe the joy of the faith. Before her I should still be an unhappy Protestant wandering in the night. But for her I should never have lent an ear to the Catholic truth, and never have considered it deserving of the trouble of inquiry. It was she who won my heart to its study, and sustained my interest in it, till at last I entered the one true fold of the great shepherd of the sheep. I should esteem it a great favor, dear Reverend Mother, if you would be so good as to publish the immense grace of which I have been the recipient, so that the intercessory power of the saint of Lisieux may become still more widely known, and that others may by her means be led to a knowledge of the faith. Be so good also, dear Reverend Mother, as to accept my most grateful thanks for your kind interest in prayers. 
continue to intercede for me that I may be able to understand more and more of the doctrines of my heavenly guide and to follow in her sure way to that happy goal. Deathbed Repentance at 28 Les Provence Gores France, July 10, 1911 Following the example of so many favored souls, who every day write to tell you of the wonders done by St. Therese, I must in my turn tell you of the marvelous conversion which she wrought here in the course of the last year. In the month of June, 1910, there was in the sanatorium of La Provence a young man of twenty-eight in the last stages of consumption, whose trying character and bigotry were a heavy cross for the nuns. I had just read the charming life of your little sister, and, having great confidence in her intercession, I addressed myself to her to obtain, on a fixed date, the conversion of the unfortunate sinner. My hopes were not disappointed. The conversion, to all appearances so difficult, was effected as though by magic, and on September 8, after having lived for thirteen years without practicing his religion, the poor young man received Holy Communion with sentiments of the most lively piety. A few days had sufficed to bring about a veritable transformation. The imitation of Christ, the Catechism, the Holy Gospels especially, were his only cherished books, and he burnt, without delay, certain pamphlets in his possession which now filled him with disgust. In his most contrite moments he used to cry out in accents one would like to be able to reproduce. Yes, it is indeed true. Jesus has pardoned me all, and without me doing anything to merit it. How I love him, and how I wish I could say all that I feel when I think of his merciful love for me. Sometimes he would take his crucifix, kiss it tenderly, and say with tears in his eyes, Poor Jesus, how much thou hast suffered, thou who wert so innocent. As for me, I am the greatest of culprits, and I dare sometimes complain. My God, have pity on my weakness, and may I continue to be the child of thy love. The last day of his prodigal son was one of continual prayer, and he died in quite an ecstasy, with the name of Jesus on his lips. His death has greatly increased the confidence of everyone here in the intercession of Sister Therese. A Deathbed Repentance at Forty France, March 1911 In March 1911, a man aged forty was at death's door, but though he had been ill for a year, his sufferings had not brought him nearer to God. Unwilling to let him know his end was approaching, those about him would not allow the priest to visit him, so his soul was on the point of being lost. When all efforts to get him a priest had failed, my family and I began a novena to Sister Therese. At the beginning of the novena, my wife succeeded in giving the sick man a picture of the little sister, which he gratefully accepted. He looked at it with pleasure and read the prayer several times a day. The night before the novena ended, Sister Therese appeared to him. How beautiful she is, he exclaimed. So beautiful that I took her for Our Lady. He recognized her afterwards by the resemblance to the picture. She told him of his approaching death and gave him a glimpse of the eternal punishments which awaited him if he did not reconcile himself to God while he had yet time. He could not express the emphasis with which she said to him, Save your soul. At seven o'clock in the morning he asked for a confessor. His parish priest came immediately, heard his confession, and gave him holy communion, which he received with great fervor. His conversion was complete, and during the three remaining days of his life he repeatedly said that, if his health were restored, he would begin a new life, for now he knew the way he ought to follow. A Deathbed Repentance at 80 March 1911, France The souvenirs of your dear little sister Therese are working miracles. One of our neighbors, an old man of 80, did not practice his religion, and had passed his life estranged from God. When he was ill, nuns were sent to nurse him, so that they might speak to him of the need of seeing a priest. For a whole week they tried by every means in their power to bring him back to God, but in vain. At last, seeing that the sister was discouraged, I gave her a packet containing some of the hair of Sister Therese. And afterwards, 
the old man, of his own accord, asked for the priest whom he had refused to see only an hour before. He made his confession and received extreme unction while fully conscious and died the following day. This, Reverend Mother, was the beautiful work of your dear little saint. A Drunkard's Death, Ireland, September 1912 I wish to make known a wonderful grace granted to a poor drunkard who always carried with him a picture of Sister Therese. He had been drinking continuously for years when one evening he bought a copy of As Little Children, The Short Life of the Little Flower, and put it in his pocket. Sometimes, when hopelessly drunk and almost on the verge of delirium, he used to say, Little Therese will save me yet. One Friday evening about a month ago, he suddenly made up his mind to go to the priest's house and take the pledge. He said he felt impelled to do it, though he could not imagine how he would be able to pass one night without drink. He was ill all that night, but did not take any spirits. On Saturday morning he fainted, and was forced to swallow some brandy. He could not sleep through the night, and was determined that, as soon as morning came, he would have a priest. When his wife got up at six, he told her to send without delay and asked the priest to call. She thought he was still under the influence of drink, but nevertheless sent the message, which by some mistake was not delivered. Later in the morning, the priest in question was cycling home after saying Mass in the country, and called at the house to know if the man had been to the eleven o'clock Mass. The poor fellow made a general confession, beginning from the time he was six years old. The priest had no stole with him, but the man, though apparently not seriously ill, insisted so strongly on making his confession that he was allowed to do so, and it lasted two hours. On Monday morning he received Holy Communion and was anointed. He died on Monday night, filled with repentance. I ascribe his wonderful conversion to Sister Therese, and I am glad it should be made known. Surely God gives her many roses to cast upon the earth. St. Therese of the Child Jesus, pray for us.